Good morning. I'm Shirley Womack, welcoming ministry staff at First United Methodist Church Rockwall. I'm excited to welcome you to the Open Door Worship Service today. Grab your coffee and your juice. It's time to worship. Welcome to Open Door here at First United Methodist Church of Rockwall. My name is Katie Newsom, and I'm the Open Door Pastor, and we are so glad that you are here to worship with us virtually this morning. If you are connecting with us on Facebook, we invite you to like our stream and say good morning in the comments to let us know that you are here. You'll notice some things look a little different in Open Door, and that is because we are continuing our work on our Opening the Next Door project as we continue to make updates to our technology and to our space that will help us center our hearts and minds together for worship, making it more accessible wherever we are. We invite you to continue to support us with your prayers and your finances. And if you have any questions about this project, I invite you to reach out to me anytime. So now I invite you to center your hearts and minds as together we sing in worship.
If you are a child or a child at heart, we have a moment that's just for you. So I'd, I'd invite you to come a little closer to your screen and get comfortable as we share in this moment together. Now children, I brought my backpack this morning because today is our annual blessing of the backpacks day. As you can see, I put on my little backpack tag and we're inviting you and your family to come later this morning to get blessed and to receive your own backpack tag that you can put on your backpack wherever you go. Children, I know that school might look a little different this year. Some of you might be going in person and some of you might be staying at home and doing it online. And it might feel a little more difficult than it normally does. And we might find ourselves feeling more angry and maybe feeling some resentment towards our teachers or our friends or our families. And I wanted to let you know that today we're talking about a part in the Lord's Prayer that says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. Jesus reminds us that it's important to pray for forgiveness, that we ask God for forgiveness, but that we ask God to help us forgive others. And so as you are starting school, and as you might be finding yourself frustrated or angry because things didn't go the way you hoped they would, I pray that you'll remember those words and that you'll work really hard to help forgive those who might have wronged you or might have hurt you and ask God for forgiveness too. And as you do that, I hope it means you are filled with grace and kindness and love to all that you meet. Will you pray with me this morning? Dear God, thank you for this day. Help us to forgive others as we seek to be graceful. We love you. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning, children. Church, I'd like to share with you an update on our capital campaign, The Trinity Project, Becoming One. On July 26th, our campaign leadership announced that 279 households are committing $2,765,063.28 over three years in support of The Trinity Project. And last week, our First Fruits Offerings continues our giving to the campaign with $308,233.82 offered to God and our church in support of the Trinity Project. During Sundays in August, we are inviting you to stop by our church from nine to two to offer your first fruits offering for our campaign. And we invite you to watch for a church conference that will be coming up in September. We thank you for your generosity and your continued support of this project. Now is also the time in our service where we, we will be collecting the morning tithes and offerings. There are a couple of different ways that you can give this morning. First, you can go online, set up a recurring gift. You can also mail in a check or drop it by our church office. Or you can pull out your cell phone and text the letters F-U-M-C-R to the number 77977. And as you continue to give, your gifts go to continue the mission and ministry of our church. This past weekend, our Club 456, that's our fourth through sixth graders, had a laser tag event on Friday evening. It was a great time to gather, a lot of fun was had, and we wanna keep our kids connected to one another and the church during these uncertain times. And your generosity made that possible. So this morning, I pray that we give remembering that our God is an extremely generous God. May we give and reflect that generosity within our church, our lives, and our community. Amen. God of creation, there from the start, before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark and flushed out the wonders of light And I 
center our hearts and minds for prayer this morning we give thanks for the gift of prayer that unites us together in spirit even as we worship apart we want to remember all those in the hospital as well as those who are discharged from area hospitals particularly Tim Gormley and Linda Dick we pray for our medical community as they seek to make sure everyone is well and recovering from COVID-19 we give thanks for their service we also pray for our military men and women our first responders and we pray for our president and world leaders would you join with me as we pray together? 
Holy and loving God, we are grateful for your presence. Because you are with us, we know that you will help us get through this difficult time. O oh God, we give you our uncertainty, our fears, our doubts, our worries, and our concerns. For it is too heavy a burden for us to carry alone. And so we pray in trust for your unconditional love and that your grace is sufficient. Holy and loving God, we pray for teachers who are trying to get ready for a new school year without the benefit of really knowing what this school year will look like. The reality of COVID-19 leads to an uncertainty about where we are. We have so many questions and we have some very real fears. And so we pray. We pray for all of our students that at every level they might find joy and peace in the year ahead. Let their learning be rewarding as well as challenging and let them enjoy the growth that comes from new experiences. Give them spirits of joy and confidence and help them to live gratefully at all times, aware of the gift of life and its incredible richness. Bless their teachers and coaches and counselors and all others who are involved in their educational process. For you have made our world extraordinarily beautiful and fascinating, and for that we give you thanks. We are happy to praise you, O oh God, as we lift our voices together and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us now to hear the word of God from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus. There were the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Amen. Good morning, church. This morning we are continuing our sermon series, Prayer as Jesus Taught Us, as we are exploring the Lord's Prayer, recognizing it as a guide and a pattern for us on how we should pray. And I'll tell you, church, I've had the great privilege of serving a number of churches and and had the privilege to watch little children, children who don't even know how to read yet, come to worship and be able to recite the Lord's Prayer because they've learned it in worship or they've learned it at home with their families. So it is my hope that here at Open Door, all of our children know the Lord's Prayer, this prayer that Jesus taught us. And I'll have to tell you uh, about a story of the Lord's Prayer uh, when I was working at another church. I was doing the children's moment, and we were talking about different names for God. One, and I asked the children, what are the names for God? And one child said God, and another child said Jesus, and this little girl, as confidently as possible, shouted at the top of her lungs, Howard! God's name is Howard! Uh, of course, eruption from the congregation in laughter, said, I don't know if that's one of God's names. She said, no, God's name is Howard. And I said, well, tell me, tell me how you know it's Howard. And she said, you know, when we say that prayer, we say, Howard, be thy name. We know these words. But sometimes when we pray, I'm not sure we always stop to think about the words. This morning, we're looking at that phrase in the Lord's Prayer that says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
The pattern of this prayer tells us that every time we pray, we are meant to ask for forgiveness. And you have to remember that the early Christians would pray this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, three times a day. Do we really need to ask for forgiveness that many times? Do, do we really do that much bad? I haven't murdered anyone. We haven't cheated on our spouses. I think sometimes we, we think that because we haven't done these big bad things, we're generally good people. And we don't really have much to ask forgiveness for. But we have to remember that sin and evil can happen in two ways, both action and thought. We know that we have to ask for forgiveness for the ways in which we've hurt other people, but I think that we often forget that our, our thoughts count here. In our minds, we can experience lust, pride, envy, etc. And as we think about these things and focus our minds on them, they can become a problem for our hearts too. We know the greatest commandment, love God and love neighbor. And we know that we are to be people who love our enemies and we are to be people who practice compassion and seek justice and mercy. And we are to share with those in need. But I have rarely met a person who can say that they do this well and good every single day or a person who says they don't need forgiveness. More commonly, I have met people who feel arguably too much guilt over not getting these things right every day. People who struggle to believe that they can be forgiven. I have had all sorts of folks come into my office and share with me their dark secrets, the worst things they've ever done. And, and I've heard it all. And as folks come to me and they ask that question, can I be forgiven? It's so easy to say yes. Uh, the Greek word metanoia was used to talk about repentance. This is a changing of mind and changing of heart. And when you repent, God longs to forgive you. And so with those folks that come to me, how easy is it to say you are seeking forgiveness and you are forgiven? And sometimes it's easy for me to say this to others, but a lot harder for me to say it to myself. Every time you pray, ask for forgiveness. God longs to forgive you. This is the moment. Take it. God would love to forgive you. And I know in our scripture, there are words that get used in this, this phrase. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses. And I want to share with you a little about these words, because sometimes I think we get a little lost in them. Jesus spoke Aramaic, and as people were translating what Jesus had said and was writing it down in Greek for our Bible that we now have, people were trying to find those words that best described what Jesus had said in Aramaic. And in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the passage reads, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Luke says, forgive us our sins. And in fact, uh, in Matthew, the only line that Jesus feels like he has to go back and explain a little bit more is this one about forgiveness. In Matthew 6, 14, Jesus says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you don't forgive others trespasses, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. What do these words mean? The Greek word for debt here means owing something to someone else, and it's usually money. This metaphor is used over and over again. Jesus is, uses it over and over again because he is primarily ministering to the working class. And first century Palestine, working class people knew what it was like to borrow. Everybody borrowed. If you were a farmer, you had a crop that was harvested once a year. So at the harvest, you made all of your money for the next year. But then there was a long time between harvest to harvest. So for the next year, working class people would borrow money, perhaps to buy seeds to plant for the next harvest, or perhaps when a family member got sick to buy the medicine and the care that they would need. So when you borrowed, what you pledged was a portion of your crops. 
And additionally, most of these farmers did not own the land that they planted and harvested their crops on. So a portion of their crops went to paying whomever they were renting land from. So what happens when they can't pay what they've borrowed? And if you didn't pay or couldn't pay what you had borrowed, you would go to the person you owed money to and you would beg them for mercy. Hopefully you had a merciful lender who would give you more time, like another 30 days to pray. But what happens if the harvest had already come and you still couldn't pay? You literally couldn't change your situation for more money. And you have what you have at that point. Maybe you can find another way. Maybe you borrow from someone else in order to pay who you owe, creating a landslide worth of debt for yourself. But if you still could find no way to pay for these debts that you owed, there were two things that would happen in the Greco-Roman world. First, you either became a slave and worked off your debts as a slave, or second, you were thrown into debtor's prison. And both of these are talked about by Jesus in the parables he tells. So how do you get out of slavery or debtor's prison? Well, you needed to find someone who cared about you enough to pay off your debt for you. And that person was called a redeemer. And that process was called redemption. And I don't know about you, but this causes me to remember the story of Ruth and Boaz from our Old Testament. And it's slightly different as it wasn't so much about money. But when Ruth and Naomi find Boaz as a distant relative and discover that he wants to marry Ruth after the death of her husband, he gets called kinsman redeemer. In the New Testament, Jesus is seen as the redeemer who is buying people back, who had been enslaved to the debt they owe to God so that we may be set free. But what does it mean to be in debt to God? God created everything, the entire cosmos, all living creatures. So if my entire existence is wrapped up in what God has done, then I owe God everything, my whole life. Now, that's not what we are asking God for forgiveness for, but when I don't live into the purpose that I was created for, when I hurt my relationship with myself, my neighbors, and God, I am not living into how God created me to be. When my life does not follow the greatest commandment to love God and love neighbor, I am in debt to God. We talk about atonement as a word in Christian theology, and I think a lot of people attach all sorts of different meanings to it but it is used to describe when our relationship with God has been hurt by something we have done. It's our work to seek to make amends. And we know this in our lives, here and now. Maybe you forgot your anniversary. Maybe you said something hurtful to a friend or a family member. We're indebted to someone until we make things right. Atonement at one meant as we seek to become one with each other, to right our wrongs. Every time we have turned our back on what God wanted us to do in the ways we treat ourselves and others, we become indebted to God. And the reality is, if I were to sum up what that debt looks like in my own life without forgiveness, in some sort of numerical form, we'd be able to see that I am way too far in the hole to get out. I'd be sent to debtor's prison. And fortunately, as Jesus reminds us in this prayer, pray and ask for his forgiveness for your debt. My friends, this is the good news. When the world withholds forgiveness and mercy from you, God is a merciful master who will always, always forgive you and your debts. God is the kind of master who will forgive you. God is the kind of landowner who will release you from your obligations. And in Luke's gospel, the language Jesus uses is a little different. Forgive us our sins. The Greek word for sin here is hamartia. And it's a word that has multiple meanings within multiple contexts. But in a Roman context, this word was connected to archery. And it meant to miss the mark. And literally, it meant missing the mark with your arrow. And in a Greek context, this word was used in the context of a Greek tragedy, primarily meaning an error of judgment or a tragic flaw. And so in both the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Old Testament, 
and our New Testament, which was written in Greek, the term harmatia began being used and was defined as sin, ranging from involuntary mistakes to serious offenses against the deity. But this is what sin is. Falling short of where I should go, missing the mark, failing to live up to the ideals of living in righteous relationships with God, self, and others. Do you ever fail to live up to your ideals? Fallen short of the person you were created to be? When we pray these words, this is forgiveness of the times we fall short of God's will and of the path that we are on. We're praying, bring us back to that right path. I know that I have trespassed, I have missed the mark, I have offended God and other people, and I know you have too. And so when we pray daily, we ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness in Greek means to let go. And wouldn't it be nice if we could just leave this phrase right here, forgive us our trespasses and God does this and is gracious and merciful, the end. But the phrase doesn't end here. And this is the part that is hard. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I mean, yikes. Listen to what we are saying. In the same way I forgive other people, I want you to forgive me, oh God. Do you want to pray that? This is a really big idea that God is gracious and merciful and wants to extend grace to us, but God is expecting that grace and mercy to rub off on us. One of the ways that we healed the world is by learning to be more gracious and merciful. We learn to be more graceful even as we seek things like righteous justice. And part of what is wrong with our world is that we think that justice means holding on to resentments and grudges and trying to get even. And this happens in politics, marriages, friendships, all of it. It is the start of wars around the world because we hold on to these things rather than releasing them. So Jesus says, to the degree that you are unable to forgive other people, God will be unwilling to forgive you. And that doesn't sound very godlike to me, but I trust that Jesus is speaking in hyperbole here, and God will forgive us in the midst of our struggling to forgive. But I also hear God saying, I've forgiven you for a lifetime of transgressions, and you cannot forgive your neighbor for something small in comparison? What's up with that? There's this story in Matthew 18 where Simon Peter comes to Jesus and asks, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? And Simon Peter's brother is Andrew, who is also a disciple, who's probably present as this question is being asked. And Simon Peter says, should it be seven times? And the Jewish scholars of Jesus' day would debate this and said that according to Jewish law, you must forgive only three times. That was the standard thought. And so Simon Peter doubled that number and then added one for good measure, thinking I'm going the extra mile here. I want Jesus to see that I am starting to understand this and I want to be generous with my forgiveness. Or maybe Simon had already forgiven Andrew six times. But Jesus says seven. Jesus says not seven, but 77. And the disciples are like, whoa, this is wrong. This is too much. And Jesus tells a parable. He talks about a certain man who owed his king a vast sum of money, 10,000 talents. And just to put that in perspective, one talent today is worth $348,000, U.S. dollars. So 10,000 talents would be $3.48 billion. That is about 200,000 years worth of labor. What this man owed the king was a debt that was absolutely impossible for him to repay in his lifetime. This is an absurd amount of money. And the king comes to collect it, and the man says, I can't pay it. Please have mercy on me. 
and the king does have mercy and forgives the entire debt. And this is ludicrous, extravagant forgiveness. And in this parable, the king represents God's forgiveness to us. And then this guy goes out and he finds one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And today, one denarii is worth $3.62. So today, that amount in total would look more like $362. And he grabs him by the throat. And he says, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant falls down and begs him for forgiveness, begs him for mercy, saying he will repay him, just give him more time. And instead of forgiveness, this man threw him into debtor's prison. And this news gets back to the king. And when he hears about it, he calls this man back and says, how can you do that? I just forgave you $3.48 billion. And now you are grabbing a man by the throat to pay you back $362? And the king withdrew, withdraws his mercy and hands him over to be jailed in debtor's prison. And Jesus says that God is a bit like this. God has extended such obscene mercy to you, and God expects you to do the same. And this is hard. I don't want to pray this prayer. I don't want to pray it a lot of times. There are so many things that we hold on to and we resent. We have lost loved ones to horrific decisions made by other human beings. We have all been wronged, and some of you have been wronged so seriously that you cannot even possibly begin to let it go. But let me tell you this about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not saying it is okay. There are things that are never okay, and they never will be. But forgiveness is releasing my right to hold it over your head forever. Forgiveness is releasing my right of retribution. Forgiveness is releasing us from having to feel the burden and the weight of this for our entire lives. This is what forgiveness is. And friends, we are called to this work, to forgive so ludicrously as God has forgiven us. And when we do this work, we heal the world. We heal our communities, we heal our own hearts, sometimes in ways that we never thought were possible. So what is it in your life that was so bad or painful that you cannot release? Think for just a moment about this. Who is it that you need to forgive and really forgive? Friends, this work of forgiveness is freeing you from resentment and pain and the work of living that life abundant that Christ has talked about us knowing and experiencing. The last prayer that Jesus prayed in Luke's gospel said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus looks at those who mocked him, who hung him on a cross, who drove nails through his feet and his hands, and he prayed for them and for us too, because he is our redeemer. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Will you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks that whatever we have done, you always forgive us. Oh God, help us to come to you and ask for forgiveness, that we would free our hearts of resentments and grudges. No, oh God, help us to show your extravagant forgiveness to all those that we know, for those that have wronged us, for those who have hurt us. Oh God, may we see in them that they are your child. And we may we remember our call to your greatest commandment, to love God and love neighbor. May we continue to do these things this day and all the days to come. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Perhaps God is stirring in your heart this morning. 
Maybe you're longing to become a member of our church, or maybe you're thinking about that person that you need to forgive. Or maybe you're longing to get more connected into the life of our church. We have a lot going on in our church, and I'd like to share with you a little about that. Today, we have our annual blessing of the backpack, students, educators, and this year, face masks. And that's gonna take place as a drive-through event from 12 to two. So we invite you to come right after this, uh, encouraging our families to come to this event. Children can bring your backpacks and we'll have backpack tags, goodie bags, and a special prayer for our children. We're also asking educators, active and retired, to come as well, either for a drive-through blessing or to make a sign of encouragement and join us as we encourage our children and parents. Additionally, we are continuing our teacher supply drive in support of Nebby Williams. That continues today through the rest of the month of August. You'll notice we have our blue barrels set up outside our church, so you can drop off school supplies anytime in those blue barrels. And we have a list on our website of the specific supplies that Nebby Williams needs. Additionally, we are continuing to pray for Ham Elementary teachers and staff. So I invite you to go on our website or on one of our social media pages for Open Door to sign up on a Google spreadsheet to pray for our Ham Elementary teachers and staff. Our fall adult registration starts today. So I invite you to go online. We have a great group of classes getting started this month. So take a look at those classes and sign up and we'll be excited to study together. We are also having a caregiver and grief dialogue support webinar. That'll be available this coming Thursday, August 20th at 7 p.m. It's the second in a series and we've had a great response to this series so far. Uh, this webinar is for those who are caring for loved ones with extended illnesses or those who are grieving. You can register on our website or call Reverend Christina Hildebrand for more information. We will not be continuing in-person worship for the month of August, and we invite you to continue to look at our plan as we make updates about how we will continue in our COVID response. As you can see, there's a lot going on in the life of our church and a lot to connect to. And if in your faith journey, you long to get more connected or even to talk with a pastor, you are welcome to talk to myself, Pastor Christina, or any of our pastoral staff at any time. It would be our honor to journey aside you for your faith journey. So now let us prepare to sing our final song in worship.
my friends, as we prepare to go forth from this time together, I invite you to hear this good news. We serve a generous God who extends merciful forgiveness to us always. So may we go forth and extend our own mercy and forgiveness and grace to all those we encounter. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for joining us today in worship. We look forward to seeing you again next week, and we hope you have a great week. But first, don't forget to grab your backpacks and come on by the church for the backpack blessing. And don't forget to get your backpack tag when you're here. See you soon. Bye. You are the